Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Last Week in AI, where you can hear us chat about what's going on with AI. As usual, we will summarize and discuss some of last week's most interesting AI news. And as always, you can also check out our Last Week in AI newsletter at lastweekin.ai for articles we did not cover in this episode. I am one of your hosts, Andrei Kurenkov. I finished my PhD at Stanford last year, and I now work at a generative AI startup. And once again, we do have a guest co-host, with Jeremy being on vacation. So I'll let her introduce herself. Hello, everyone. My name is Daliana Liu. Uh, in my past life, two years ago, I was a senior data scientist at Amazon. I built machine learning solutions for uh, Amazon customers, AWS customers. Uh, I also worked on experimentation, A-B testing, um, some areas in a general data science domain. I left my full-time job to host my podcast called The Data Scientist Show, talking about data scientist project in different industries and their career journey. I also advised uh, data and AI companies on community building, go-to-market, um, and recently, I focus on uh, career coaching, helping data scientists find a career path that works for them. That's right. So another experienced podcaster and interviewer of many people out there in industry, similar to John Crone from last week. And uh, as we've chatted, maybe a slightly different background with not as much emphasis on AI and machine learning. So your kind of takes and uh, additions to the discussion, especially this week, which is very heavy on kind of consumer news that affects all of us and not just the technical folk, uh, will be fun to hear. Yeah. Before we dive in to the news, as usual, I do want to give a call out, shout out to some nice feedback we got on Apple Podcasts. Uh, as always, I do appreciate reviews. Uh, someone said, great content presented in a fun, engaging way. We do try to make it fun, although sometimes <laughs> it can be hard with more technical stuff. Uh, someone said good overview of AI hype. That is also appreciated. And yeah, uh, just as always, appreciate reviews. And we also got a few comments on YouTube, including someone saying that AI theme song was soothing as well. And I am going to start including... AI theme songs at the end of every podcast, because that seems pretty fun. We'll keep our usual theme at the beginning. So if you are a hardcore listener who goes all the way to the end of a podcast, well, uh, you'll get that nice, fun tidbit to look forward to. And just a quick FYI, this time we are going to try and record the video of this, uh, partially because we will have a bit of a chat at the end where I'll be going into my background. So you can go and look for that on uh, YouTube. Hopefully I do wind up editing the video and not just, uh, you know, cutting all of this out. Yeah, my toxic trait is to ask people questions about their careers. So I have to do this, Andre. That's right. Well, let's get into news, starting with our tools and apps section. And the first story to chat about is, of course, GPT-4.0. So on Monday, OpenAI had a little video stream where they announced their latest model, GPT-4 Omni, which is a iteration on GPT-4 natively trained to accept audio as input and also output images and text. And they had very impressive demos of what it is capable of. So they had this uh, like 20 minute stream in which they showed basically real time interaction via voice with this assistant very much. Many people compared it to a movie, Her, and I think that's pretty appropriate. Uh, so you can hit a little button, the microphone goes on, and you can talk to the AI and without almost any latency, it processes your speech input and produces a speech output that is very human-like. Uh, the intonations of voice, uh, emotion, etc., are very high quality, even maybe beyond what you've seen with typical speech synthesis. And this is coming with all the intelligence of ChatGPT and GPT-4 models before it. In fact, 
on benchmarks and all some of the technical numbers and so on. They uh, say that it's even better across the board on all these tasks. And even beyond all of that, they also announced that this model would be uh, half the cost and twice as fast as GPT-4. Uh, so that's exciting for me as someone working with it and using the API. Like That's a big deal to have GPT-4 quality intelligence at twice the speed and half the cost. So very, I think, highly discussed and I thought very impressive uh, progress here from OpenAI. I'm curious what you thought, Taliana. Yeah, um, I watched some uh, demo clips. I think the real-time translation looks really cool. And uh, one feature I'm very excited to try, I'm not sure if it's available right now, the, uh, the uh, capacity to view your screen on your desktop. Um I think that would be really cool to have a AI companion to see what I'm working on, maybe call me out. And uh, I don't know if you feel this way. Sometimes it's very lonely to work on things by yourself. But if you do something like pair programming or uh, I try this, just have a friend do some co-working with me, silent. I'm more productive because you just feel like, oh, someone's watching. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I might be more productive. Maybe you can just uh, chat with it. Is it it, her, him? Um, I that's think a that's, good a, question. <laughs> that's a feature I'm excited about. Uh, on my right. phone, I also played with the audio uh so it's i think in the demo it shows a female's voice uh, i think they provide a few options it, they have male's voice different type of male's voice as well um but i guess the default is female voice because um i think a female uh virtual assistant sounds less threatening mm -hmm. kind of psychologically yeah, would you take, would you, would you, if OpenAI develops something like her, would you, would you date an AI? Well, many people already are, um, <laughs> things like Replica and many other apps, mm -hmm. and that's its all, whole own question. And it's true that with the ability to do real-time chat and have these very, uh, it's true that the female voice in particular highlighted in the demo was very friendly and warm and yeah. Kind of non-threatening, and uh, some people even characterize it as sexy or, you know, similar to, again, the movie Her, yeah. where the, the plot of the movie is that the main character falls in love with an AI. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, one of the many implications of this announcement is probably people uh, forming even deeper emotional bonds with AI than they have been, and there's been a lot of people forming strong bonds with AI for a while now. Yeah. Um, I have ChatGP open right now. I want to see what was its response if I ask. Okay, um, let's try it. Ask it to, hello, uh, I, I really like your voice. Would you go on a date with me? I'm glad you enjoy our conversations. However, since I'm just an AI... I don't have the ability to go on dates or form personal relationships. <laughs> I'm here to help with any questions or topics you'd like to discuss. What's on your mind today? So <laughs> it doesn't... Not right now. Yeah, we'll Not see. Not right now. <laughs> that is how you make a lot of money. So hopefully they, I don't know, keep thoughtful on that question because mm -hmm. it is, uh, I think it's possible to exploit people. We've seen that before. Uh, and <laughs> I... You know, people uh, can maybe find a way to still convince it, but we'll see. Yeah. And um, there's some more details uh, worth noting. So they did also announce a desktop app uh, that uh, they demonstrated, for instance, coding assistance, where it's uh, you can uh, copy some of the code you're working on, and it will go straight to which has GPT app. So the workflow is a little bit streamlined. There's no need to go to a website and they presumably will add that ability to look at your desktop and check it out. 
So yeah, this is the big news of a week, I think. And uh, if you haven't looked at any of the demos, there are quite a few showcasing live translation, showcasing two AIs talking to each other and doing some duet singing. It does have a uh, built-in uh, image processing capability. So they say it's natively multimodal. So another thing they showed is that as you're talking to it, you can show it images, uh, have a video stream of what's in front of you. And with your voice, you can ask, okay, what am I looking at? Or uh, even just show it equations and say, can you help me work through this equation? Things like that. And that also works very seamlessly. So yeah, I think not some people on Twitter and the AI community have expressed disappointment, surprisingly, saying, oh, this is not GPT-5. This is uh, arguably opening up plateauing because the intelligence and the benchmarks aren't that far off from what we've seen. But personally, I'll say I was very impressed. Yeah. What, uh, what kind of feature do you think you want to use immediately in your personal life or in your workflow? That's an interesting question. Uh, I think personally, I do use chatbots a lot already via the text input. And I don't think I will in the near term kind of want to use the conversational aspect of it in general. But perhaps over time, especially for just random questions and thoughts that are not related to coding, for instance, I might try it out more and see if it's fun to just interact with AI in this way, which wasn't really possible prior to this sort of thing. Yeah. And moving on to the next story, which is from Google and very related to the GPT-40 announcement. So just a day after the OpenAI event, Google held its own big event with a slew of announcements related to AI, which we'll cover uh, over the next few stories. But the first one we'll start with, and that is the most related to GPT-40, is Project Astra, a real-time multimodal AI assistant that can, in almost real time, without almost any lag, listen to your voice, uh, look at video inputs uh, and answer questions about what you're seeing. I am basically describing what you just went over with GPT-40, and that's because it is very similar in some ways to GPT-40. So in some of the demo clips Google shared, it wasn't quite as emotive in its uh, voice output, and it, it isn't quite as real-time. There's a bit more of a lag going on. But still, uh, it seems like OpenAI and DeepMind have been working on something pretty similar. And OpenAI beat Google to a punch with their announcement. But Google then had the unveiling of this Astra. And in fact, there were some fun examples on Twitter from people working on it of, for instance, someone chatting with Project Astra as they were watching the live stream of OpenAI. Uh, and uh, people walking around the office at Google with Project Astra and showcasing what it can do. So, you know, now we'll have uh, two of these types of chatbots coming soon, at least. And Google has announced Gemini Live, which is a voice-only assistant for easy back-and-forth conversation and a new feature in Google Lens for video-based searches. So lots of updates. Astra is still in early prototype phase, so they aren't rolling out as soon as GPT-4.0, which is pretty much out to many people already. Uh, but again, I was pretty impressed by what Google and DeepMind have done here. And very few companies are capable of something like GPT-40. It seems like DeepMind is, even if they are a little bit behind. Yeah. Well, how do you think those works? Do they literally have spies in each other's company and pick the same day to do the announcement? 
Well, the Google I.O. announcement, uh, I guess we knew that the event would be happening, that there would be a bunch of announcements. Yeah. I do wonder if OpenAI planned to have their unveiling the day before mm -hmm. to steal a funder from under Google to some extent. But in, in terms of product development, I'm guessing they just both realized that real-time voice interaction seemed like a killer next advance that they should both target and both of them went for it because from a technical perspective, uh, without getting too much into it, uh, some of the things regarding like real-time processing are very impressive. But on the other hand, we've had years and years of research on training multimodal uh, models that accept multiple modalities beyond just text with text and images and now with audio. So it makes sense that the trend has very much been to have more and more modalities as input, more and more modalities as output. And it makes sense that both OpenAI and DeepMind kept pushing in that direction. Yeah. And I also saw that Gemini 1.5 Pro is going to offer a 2 million token context window, the largest of any chatbot in the world. And the GPT-40 is at... 128,000 context window, um, and uh, Google is working towards an unlimited context window size. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it's useful for consumer use case, or it's more for storing all the knowledge in the, in the world? What does it mean for unlimited context window? Right. Well, I guess in practice, it probably won't be truly unlimited, right? You can't have an infinitely long input and expect the LLM to, or now, I guess not LLM, now it's a multimodal model uh, expected to process that correctly. But even at 2 million tokens, right? That's a whole bunch of books. And I do think for less sort of consumer applications, but for many industrial applications and for many jobs. At that point, you can input many documents, like maybe even your entire code base, yeah. <laughs> and have the AI process that and reply. And that's been one of the limitations I found when working with AI for coding, for instance, is that it doesn't have the context of your current code base and your current company and all of this stuff. So if it can process a whole bunch of documents uh, when processing your input and question, I think it'll be much more effective. And in that sense, having a longer context window and also in addition to that, maybe retrieval that a lot of people have also worked on is to some extent a game changer. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the lightning round where we'll try to keep it a bit shorter because there's a lot to still get through. And the first story is another announcement from the Google event. And it is regarding their search experience. Uh, Google is now rolling out AI overviews, which previously was known as search generative experience. Uh, so slightly less nerdy moniker there. And it is pretty much similar to what they've been experimenting for a while now, where when you do Google search, at least for some queries, there will be a Gemini model to process your input and produce the output kind of at the top that is not just links, but an actual AI response that has processed the contents of some websites, produced a response, and then there are some attached links for you to follow. And they are have been experimenting with search uh, generative experience for a while. Now they are saying it will start to really roll out to more people and uh, be in more Google searches. Again, something we, I guess, knew was coming and something that it will be interesting to see uh, to what extent people will just stay on Google rather than going to chatbots or things like perplexity because Google already will have AI built in. And then the next announcement, because again, there were many from Google, is that they have unveiled their own Sora type model with Vio. So they have produced some clips that show it generating 
pretty high resolution HD videos uh, for various things. A lot of sort of similar things we've seen from Sora with clips of tracking shots of various kinds, some surreal imagery of like llamas wearing glasses, this sort of stuff. And the video is pretty smooth, pretty different from most previous AI outputs where, you know, even just a few months ago uh, or last year, video from AI was clearly AI generated. There are lots of ways to see that it was AI. With this, it's much more natural and convincing. Although I will say looking at the clips, it's nowhere near the quality of Sora in terms of it's still pretty clearly AI from this VO model, even if it is a lot better. And alongside VO, Google has also announced Imagine Free, the latest iteration of their image uh, text-to-image model, which similar to Dali Free and other things is producing higher quality outputs and and more complex uh, inputs that uh, previously would not have worked as well. Have you uh, taken a look at this or in general when Sora was released, uh, how did you react? Was your mind blown by how AI video generation is progressing? Uh, yeah, I guess because there are previously a lot of other AI, you know, video generation products like, uh, Pika and, uh, um, I don't know. I just, I saw people have some comparison, but I guess I'm already kind of used to, um, the quality and, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I think when it just, uh, AI, generate the video when it was just launched you definitely feel oh wow this is a game changer and then you saw some youtubers would add sometimes uh kind of similar to like a b-roll ai generated video you just feel oh yeah it's so obvious it's ai generated um i think for our humans perception um if you are able to generate something like cartoon that's really cool like 2D anime style, and uh, that's fine. But if you want to make us believe it's real kind of footage, um, I think there's still a long way to go. It has to be like near 100% kind of real because I think a human eye does the thing. If it's just slightly off, it feels just not real. That That's how I feel. Yeah, and... Definitely with this VO announcement, if you look at the videos, there is just some less consistency between the frames, some sort of weird AI blurring that happens that is pretty obvious. So uh, Sora, at least some videos were convincing, but again, I agree that in most cases you could still tell that it was AI. So, and that's why, you know, the, the highlight kind of showcases focused more on the surreal and kind of magical and yeah. uh, very saturated imagery rather than the sort of things we often see in TV and movies. And now, one more announcement from Google before we move on. There are even more we haven't aren't going to cover in this, but the last one we will cover is their new music AI sandbox. So in addition to everything else, they are unveiling a new music making tool. It will accept text inputs and generate short audio clips or stems based on the prompt. And so this is a little bit more catered towards music making as opposed to the tools we've seen that generate entire songs that are more, uh, I would say, consumer related. Uh, And this, again, as with a lot of announcements from this event, isn't being available. It's just a sort of demonstration video that they are working on it. And it may be a long time until any of us are able to try it. But Google sure, if nothing else, announced a lot of stuff (laughs) yesterday. Yeah, and uh, I did you watch the uh, Sam Altman's interview on the All In podcast last Friday? I haven't, no. So uh, one of the hosts asked him 
about um, copyright. Um, I think they he mentioned they're not sure about how to credit artists, and then they're kind of afraid to get into the area. So I think they're not doing any music generation. Generation. Um, I think it's uh, in this perspective might be a bold move for Google because, for example. Uh, one of the topic they discussed was if someone wants to generate a song in Taylor Swift's style, even if it's not using any Taylor Swift's music directly, um, tweeting those music, but learning her style from the news articles, her her maybe her lyrics, um, is this. Will this have any copyright issue related to you know Taylor Swift? I think that's um, interesting, and uh, yeah, I think I might play with this because I have some idea generating some fun songs that talking about data science struggles. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, a lot of podcasters, I guess, are probably yeah. gonna do this, and uh, I think it's a good point, and maybe that's why they focused more on these short audio clips or stems and more instrumental things like viola or clapping Mm. rather than generating songs of lyrics because copyright is especially in music kind of forny and one last story for the section that is not about google and it's about the other big player (laughs) we often talk about on fropic So Anthropic did not have any of these sorts of massive announcements going on, but they did have a couple. So first, they have announced a prompt engineering tool that helps you craft the best input to Anthropic's cloud to be able to get the most out of it. They also are launching Anthropic in Europe now, so expanding to a wider user base, and we'll get to... A new, a different announcement related to their company and business in just a short while. But Tropic still in a race, but with these announcements of the live voice assistance and almost real time audio input, it does seem like OpenAI and Google are maybe leading the pack right now with the most cutting edge AI. Yeah. What do you think about the uh, prompt generation? I think it'll be interesting but because a lot of people probably still aren't using chatbots mm-hmm. in some sense. And I think this is one of these things that people will learn how to craft the inputs. Uh, so this might help with that. At the same time, what I found is with regards to this topic of prompt engineering and like crafting prompts, in general, what I found is the in most cases, what you want is just to be very clear and you know almost the way you would communicate to another person, just like lay out your task in clear terms and it'll do what you want. Uh, and so in some sense, it's intuitive and I'm not sure this is required unless you have some very tricky things where you might need to know some of the more advanced strategies. Yeah, and uh, uh, I feel as the model is getting better, maybe eventually, do you think we still need uh, a lot of prompt engineering? Um, And uh, I remember a couple of months ago, the prompt engineer is a very hot title. You saw something like 500K salary. I'm I'm not sure whether this is just a... kind of a research role for the short period of time. I feel as the model is getting better and better, maybe the engineering on the prompt is going to, the effort there is going to be reduced. Also, I feel uh, this feature is important if you are doing something very repetitive uh, kind of task, but also feel it takes away of our ability to think the specific thing you want to ask. So I think, for example, if you want to uh, doing something like create an architecture for like a workflow or a pipeline, maybe I would say it's still a good idea to at least think about it a little bit because you might get influenced by the prompt generated, which is only trained on previous data. Um, 
And uh, maybe it can serve as a tool if you feel stuck. It can give you some inspiration or you already have some idea about like the type of question you want to ask and then use it to double check, oh, if I'm missing Mm -hmm. something. Right. Yeah, I do think personally that the idea of prompt engineers a role is was a bit of a fad and and not something that'll be here long term. Uh, already, I still feel that just being a clear communicator is enough to be a good crafter of prompts. And that'll be more and more the case as these models are trained to be aligned to what humans want them to do. So uh, that's my take is no, you don't need prompt engineering as a unique skill set. You need to be a good communicator, which is true in many jobs as is, and something that isn't easy necessarily for people. So this is just going to make it more important to be good at communication uh, than it already is. Yeah. And now moving on to applications and business with some more exciting news, starting with OpenAI. And this came out just after a couple, uh, one or two, I think maybe one day after the announcement of GPT-4.0 with the news that Ilya Suskover, the chief scientist and one of the co-founders of OpenAI, is officially leaving the company. This is, of course, following up on the drama from last year where Ilya and several other members of the board, for a brief uh, window of time, made it so Sam Altman was not the CEO of OpenAI. And then Ilya, at the time, of course, said that he regretted that action that arguably hurt OpenAI. So... Now he is departing to do some other ventures. He never did go back to work after that incident, although he was still an employee. And the interactions on Twitter, at least, were very friendly. There was no big drama. Ilya posted saying that... Yeah, very corporate speaking. Yeah, Ilya posted that it was great <laughs> to be up in AI, and Sam Altman responded saying that Ilya is great. All of that. <laughs> uh, there's now a new chief scientist replacing... Uh, Ilya in that role. And the one bit of drama that did happen that's worth noting is after Ilya's announcement, Jen Leakey, who co-leads the super alignment team and is Mm. one of the people who published the initial alignment paper, at least one of the early ones from OpenAI on RLHF, also said that he's resigning. And Less corporate speak, I will say. He tweeted, <laughs> I resigned, yeah. I believe, and that's it. So that does indicate maybe some tensions going on, at least two, more so than Ilya leaving, which I think is not as surprising. Yeah. Um, also, on the uh, All In podcast last week, they asked Sam again about uh, what happened there. I think he didn't provide a lot of more information, but he did say, yes, there was a conflict in terms of uh, culture. Um, and previously, a lot of board members have experienced in nonprofit um, come from that world and maybe since OpenAI is not like nonprofit anymore, so there's a he f- the way he frame it is a culture clash. Uh, I think it's probably around AI safety. Um, and al- although they didn't promote a new chief scientist, I did see they promoted a um, not like a the promotion. I did mention this guy. He is the director of research. Um, Jacob Pachoki. Mm-hmm. Um, are you familiar with this person? I think he's been, it looks like he's been director of research since last October. And uh, he might take over kind of the chief scientist role or has more influence in the research. That's right. Yeah, he is announced as the new chief scientist, in fact. And he, similar to Ilya, has a pretty strong tracker, track record with research, and he's been with OpenAI since 2017, so kind of a long-time employee. OpenAI started, I believe, late 2015, 2016, mm-hmm. so he's been there from 
early on before GPT even happened. Right.、Uh, I'm just looking at his LinkedIn. Okay, he joined as a research lead in 2017. Previously, was a postdoc fellow at Harvard. He was a software engineer intern at Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> and、uh, yeah, I think he did his、uh, college bachelor degree in computer science from University of Warsaw.、Mm -hmm. And the next story is also about employees and who's leading what companies. This time with regards to Anthropic and the announcement of someone being hired rather than leaving the company. And the person is Mike Krieger, who is now joining Anthropic as Chief Product Officer, and he is a pretty notable figure. He was a co-founder and CTO of Instagram, and later also Artifact, which、uh, was a personalized news app that was acquired by Yahoo. And he has, in an announcement, was said to oversee product engineering, product management, and product design efforts. As we work to expand,、uh, this is the language from the announcement. As we work to expand our suite of enterprise applications and bring cloud to a wider audience. So once again, showcasing that now these are not just research labs; they are very commercial, and they are very much seeking growth and seeking income. And with this announcement, I think Anthropic does position themselves more strongly. In that aim. Next up, we're moving on to lightning round, and finally, a story not about Anthropic <laughs> or Google or OpenAI.、Uh, this one is a story about Unitree, a Chinese robotics company, and they have released details about their second humanoid model, the G1 humanoid agents, that notably will be priced at sixteen thousand dollars, which is very、uh, cheap. It's、uh, cheaper than the first iteration, which was ninety thousand, and presumably cheaper than pretty much any other humanoid you can hope to get. And if you want to look at it, it's it is human in shape, and in some ways similar to what you saw from Boston Dynamics, with very wide range of motions, being able to rotate its torso all the way around, and and just doing all sorts of flexibility. Part of why it. Will be costing less. Is it is smaller than a human? It's like almost child sized,、uh, and it compared to some of the other humanoids we've seen, the numbers aren't necessarily as impressive. Where it can't、uh, carry necessarily as much weight、uh, in its arms,、uh, the battery life will have two hours per charge, etc. But Yeah, definitely notable. We've been talking a lot about humanoids. I don't know if you've seen the strand on of a lot of robotics companies being funded and announcing humanoid robots in development,、uh, but this one is adding to that trend, and、uh, I think with a low cost, definitely making it seem more possible. We'll be seeing more humanoid robots out in the wild. Yeah, I think. Mm, after AI model reach、uh, kind of converge to a level, I think maybe we might talk about it later.、Um, the next step will probably <clears throat> put it in the real real world, and、uh, I think robotics probably is the next <clears throat> frontier. And、uh, robotics is really hard. I remember reading something saying,、uh, you know, it's easy to do some lift some like something heavy, do those things, but for those tasks,、like、for example, putting Things in the dishwasher is extremely hard for、um, robots to have that、uh, precision, and、uh, yeah, I think there are still a lot of <clears throat> interesting challenges for researchers to solve. And、uh, I also look at this robot. I think intentionally they design it in a way that not looking like a human, so doesn't have a face, doesn't have any skin.、Um, Uh, I think it's kind of branded as a task-focused robot.、Um, I'm curious whether I think there、uh, saw this robot in Japan.、Uh, those, but I haven't seen it from bigger companies to try to develop.、Um, oh, I think Tesla would launch the the robot, but I I don't think that looks like a human. I'm kind of curious. Are 
people I don't know that's a weird thing <laughs> I'm yeah, curious think, about uh, developing it's, like it's skin. true that in general <laughs> uh in commercial like big businesses and what we've been seeing the trend mm-hmm. has been when you make a humanoid robot it looks like a robot yeah it has bare metal and usually only at most like an abstract face with a screen and while there have been demonstrations of things that look a little bit more human-like especially from japanese researchers that isn't something that companies are seeking to do i think and then partly because the aim is to uh get these things doing tasks and work and not you know socially interacting of us so that's uh, definitely a bit more far off than having just these robots moving stuff and solving chores for us yeah and uh, i think if i hug a human the human interaction and release oxytocin i wonder if there's research on if i sh- handshake with a robot <laughs> would i release oxytocin would i boost my mental health does it create uh, some sort of connection maybe and next story, we are moving on to robo taxis with a few stories on that, starting with Cruise. And the news is that they will start testing in the Phoenix area with human safety drivers on board. For a little bit of context, Cruise had a major incident last year in a crash that essentially halted their efforts and rollout of their self driving cars for now quite a while. So this is pretty notable to show them getting back on the roads and slowly trying to roll things out again. It seems very carefully since they are adding these human safety drivers. Mm. So uh, hopefully I'm a fan of robot taxis. So I hope Cruz can get back in the game, so to speak. Yeah. I only tried uh, Waymo like three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. For the yeah. first time, um, I think I'm yeah a little bit conservative, um, and I feel oh I I want the company to collect more data before I actually try it. And also I think um, when we evaluate those accidents, we tend to have a higher standards for robot taxi. Um, we don't necessarily compare that to the accident ratio for human drivers um sometimes you think think about it as like a little unfair for the researchers but i do think it's necessary to um evaluate those accidents even if statistically speaking it's it's safe but i think understanding that the root cause is important speaking of which uh the next story is that The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is now probing Amazon-owned Zooks, which also is developing self-driving vehicles after two crashes. Mm. So Zooks, uh, since March, has been expanding its vehicle testing in California and Nevada to include a wider area and be able to drive in higher speeds at nighttime. And it seems that now... Its vehicles have been involved in two crashes while they were driving that resulted in minor injuries to motorcyclists. Uh, Zooks, unlike Waymo or Cruise, did not try to roll out a commercial offering yet. They just are testing and uh, not too many details on this yet as to whether the vehicles cost it or not. But we've been talking with more and more examples of crashes and this is adding to that trend of, as you say, the standard for cellular vehicles is high. And one last story for a section, again, on robotaxis. Uh, lots of stories on that this week. And this time it's about Waymo. And it is also under investigation from that administration after some crashes and mishaps. Apparently, there have been 22 reports of crashes or potential traffic safety law valuations, and this investigation will aim to evaluate the software's ability to avoid collisions with stationary objects and its response to traffic safety control devices. Uh, this yeah, is following up two days after the Zooks announcement. So this administration sure has a lot of work to do <laughs> with regards to self-driving vehicles, it seems. 
And on to our next section, projects and open source. And the first story is going back to Google. They had some announcements on this front as well, in addition to all the product announcements. And what they announced was first a preview of Gemma 2. So Gemma is their main open source uh, language model that we've covered previously. Now they're saying that in June, they'll be rolling out uh, Gemma 2 that will have some larger variants and will uh, presumably be much better. And besides that, the kind of bigger news on this front is that they announced Polygemma, which is an open vision language model. So unlike Gemma, which is just a language model, this can accept image inputs as well as text. And they are now releasing it through all the usual platforms of GitHub and Hugging Face. People are able to now build on top of this. And this is pretty notable because there are much fewer open source, high quality vision language models compared to open uh, language models, of which we are now many. Uh, So yeah, Google continuing to push in this direction. And and this is almost now a new competitive front with Meta, of course, also releasing a lot of models. seems like to be uh, seen seriously, this is one of the things they're investing in. And another big story for open source models, the next one is Falcon 2, which is the UAE's new AI model release. So I think last year, uh, or even maybe two years ago, Falcon was one of the first large language models to be open sourced. It, at the time, was pretty big news to have a language model with many billions of parameters out there in the open, prior to that becoming much more of a thing with things like Llama. And so now they have launched the second iteration of Falcon with Falcon 2 11b and Falcon 2 11b VLM, another vision language model like Polygemma. And the numbers are, as usual, with model releases, pretty good. They say that Falcon 2 11b outperforms Meta's Llama 3 and performs on par with Google's Gemma for those uh, sizes of models. And both of these models are open source and provide unrestricted access to developers worldwide. So yeah, open source continuing to push forward with more and more models that people can build upon and continue to improve. Uh, Pretty big news of these two combined this week. Yeah. And just one more story for this section. And this one is coming from Hugging Face. And it is about a software library rather than an actual uh, model. So as we covered last week, they released a model for robotics, the robot. This week, they are announcing Transformers Agents 2.0, which is a framework to make it so you can have agents that can iterate based on past observations to complex to complete uh, solve complex tasks and they show with this agent framework that for instance using a llama 370b instruct agent it can outperform gpt4 based agents in the gaia leaderboard as with other Software announcements, this one is notable just because Hugging Face libraries are used very often by people out there building software. And agents is one of the challenges we haven't quite solved with language models and with AI in general. It's still very much an ongoing effort. So having this uh, library for people to build upon could accelerate that significantly. Moving on to research and advancements, um, which we'll have just a couple stories, not too many uh, this week. The first one is the platonic representation hypothesis, a pretty interesting conceptual paper, not any breakthrough on performance, but very interesting ideas. So the 
key idea being presented in this paper is that platonic representation hypothesis that says that neural networks trained with different objectives and on different data and modalities are converging to a shared statistical model of reality in their representation space. In neural networks, when you give it an image or give it some text, that gets mapped to a big set of numbers, the representation. And what this paper shows is that across various models trained with different data sets and so on, as you get bigger, as you get more performant, as you get more uh, able to do multiple tasks, the representations converge and become more and more similar. And so there is this hypothesis that there is a one true kind of ideal representation of underlying reality where images and text and so on are just kind of uh, projections from reality. And they yeah. have a lot of details in this paper as to why this initial hypothesis may be true with things like the capacity uh, hypothesis that if an optimal representation exists, then larger models that can explore more possible solutions in terms of representations will find that optimal or get closer to that optimal representation. And then in addition to that, if there are, uh, there's the multi-task scaling hypothesis that an increasing number of tasks will uh, be subjected to learn representations that can solve all those tasks. And the simplicity bias hypothesis saying that larger models can fit the data in different ways and will generally tend towards the simplest possible solution. It's a very interesting kind of insight and hypothesis, not quite proven in this, but there are some numbers showing that as you get bigger and as you uh, get more multitask, the nearness and similarity of these different models gets bigger. Yeah, it is interesting. Like there is a only the one source of truth. It's also although it's from different dimension, text, vision, but it feels like the law of large numbers. If you have you know enough, everything kind of converge in the middle. So right, and uh, it also relates to some extent uh, to research in neuroscience where. It's been known for a while that representations of images, for instance, do in, in neural nets do correlate with how representations of images happen in the human brain. And you can actually do a sort of mapping. They're not the same, but there are shared characteristics. And are, in this paper, we do go slightly into how it seems like neural nets are in, for instance, how they represent color are getting more similar to humans. So that is another kind of point in favor of this hypothesis. Yeah. And next up, the other research paper we'll cover is Sutra Scalable Multilingual Language Model Architecture. And in this paper, they show how you can train a model on over 50 languages while having good performance across those languages rather than being generally much better at English than other languages. And the key technical bit is that they essentially separate language from actual intelligence. They begin by having a language encoder and then later have a language decoder, basically saying in the input phase, we'll take the language and first process the language itself. And then the language model will just learn to think in terms of concepts, so to speak, uh, in a more abstract space where all languages kind of map onto the same thing and the language model reasons on that. And when they have an evaluation, they show that compared to GPT-4, for instance, it's not as good at English or Hindi at all, but it is more consistent across many more languages. So things that GPT-4 doesn't do quite as well on, for instance, Tamil or uh, Telugu, uh, this model does do very well on. And this 
I do think it's pretty notable because there are many, many languages in the world. And if there's an approach that makes it so a uh, model is effective or almost equally effective in all of them, that would be very useful. Moving on to the policy and safety section, and the first story is about a bipartisan Senate bill on AI security. This is the Secure AI Act of 2024, and it would require the National Institute of Standards and Technology to update the National Vulnerability Database and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security agents to update their Common Vulnerabilities and Exposure Program. In addition, the national security agents would be agency would be tasked with establishing an AI security center to provide an AI test bed for research for private sector and academic researchers and develop guidance to prevent counter AI techniques. It seems like uh, some of this would go into effect pretty soon. This would have 30 days after the enactment uh, of the legislation to evaluate how to do this. Uh, and it kind of uh, has some emphasis on public-private communications to stay updated on threats and safeguard against threats facing infrastructure. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of AI bills being introduced in the Senate, with this one just being the latest one. So it seems like uh, with AI being as big as it is, there's a lot more efforts going into that on the policy front in the US. And the next story is about the UK AI Safety Institute, and it has released an open source tool set called Inspect that is designed to strengthen AI safety and facilitate the development of AI evaluation. Uh, they say that uh, this is the first AI safety testing platform spearheaded by a state-backed body that is released for wider use. And as part of this, they do release data sets for evaluation test, uh, solvers to carry out with test, and scorers to evaluate the work of these uh, things going through the test and aggregate the scores into metrics. And uh, this would be open source and possible to expand with more Python packages. So yeah, now uh, we'll see if the big companies will actually use this and uh, release metrics on safety and uh, the kind of metrics that are part of this. And on to the lightning round, one more story in the section. And it is about protesters fighting to stop AI and how they're split on how to do it. A group of activists called Pause AI that we have covered in the past has protested recently and called for the halt in development of large AI models because they believe it could pose a risk to humanity's future. Apparently, protests are, have been taking place globally, uh, including San Francisco, New York, Berlin, Rome, and Ottawa. And it seems that, um, yeah, I don't know. What... <laughs> and this story goes into, yeah, not being sure or some members of the movement disagreeing uh, on the necessary way. Some people are even considering sit-ins at AI developers' headquarters with OpenAI being an example where these protesters would just sit outside their offices as part of a protest. So uh, still definitely a small effort in general, but... I wouldn't be surprised if there's going to be more calls like this uh, by more people to just say, AI is moving too fast, just stop and, and let us catch up. Uh, yeah. And on to the last section, synthetic media and art. And the first story is once again going back to Google. And they did have one announcement on this front uh, alongside the rest. The story is that Google's invisible AI watermark will help identify, identify generative text and video. And this is an expansion on their AI watermarking technology, Synth ID. They say that uh, this was first announced in August, but now 
uh, Google has enabled SynfID to inject inaudible watermarks into AI-generated music, and this will generally expand to any modality, including uh, potentially text in the near future. So similar to other news you've covered in terms of Meta, OpenAI, all deciding to include watermarks to be able to detect synthetic imagery uh, and uh, at least if the metadata is there, uh, kind of classify it as such. Yeah. Do you think they need to uh, unify in one watermark, maybe kind of become like a standard so every company is having the same thing? I think so, uh, personally. And a lot of companies are already doing this with C2PA, where they have a standard that they've collaborated on. Google and the and Meta have not adopted that standard exactly. They have uh, taken a different route, and uh, and possibly it may not be easy, uh, but it probably would be ideal for there to yeah, be a standard yeah. that everyone adopts. Next story, how one offer pushed the limits of AI copyright. This is about Elisa Shoup, who has successfully registered a copyright for a novel she wrote using OpenAI's chat GPT. Uh, this novel is AI machinations, telling called webs and typed words, and it is among the first creative works to receive a copyright with AI-generated text being at least a part of the creation. Uh, and the U.S. Copyright Office has granted the copyright registration, but only recognized her as the author of the selection, coordination, and arrangement of text generated by artificial intelligent intelligence, which means that no one can copy the book about permission, but the actual sentences and paragraphs themselves are not copyrighted and could theoretically be rearranged and republished as a different book. So yeah, this is still an open question on copywriting stuff you write with AI, and it seems like we have a bit more clarity of this happening. I'm curious, Deliana, for your interviews, have you started doing any prep using AI models to generate questions or at least like research background? Yeah. Uh, so because the people I interview, a lot of them don't have any public information online. So it does require me to sometimes do a 30 minute pre-show chat, but uh, I have played with it. Oh, for example, generated a question in the Tim Ferriss style. And, uh, um, but sometimes the AI generated words are very verbose. I have to, uh, I think I get inspired by the idea. Um, and then I will still probably use a lot of my own, um, uh, content. Um, but I do use Anthropic sometimes to help me summarize uh, what would be a good chapter for me to put it on YouTube uh, highlights because uh, I don't know, I haven't tested with a GPT-4.0, but previously I find Anthropic has given me better results uh, when it process like longer context window compared to uh, chat GPT. Chat GPT often ignore something in the mid session, only focusing on the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. A couple more stories before we move on to a bit of an interview section. So the first one is Stellaris gets a DLC about AI that features AI created voices. Uh, Stellaris is a video game and their latest downloadable content to Machine Age uses generative AI technologies to create some assets, including generating voices for an AI antagonist and a player advisor, which of course, uh, is this is a controversial topic, especially voiceover in video games. So this drew some pushback uh, and the games director actually had to address it and reassure the players that the AI voice generation uh, doesn't mean that voice actors uh, won't at least receive royalties for every line created. So pretty significant in that this is a big game. This is uh, 
a big developer, not huge, not like, you know, millions of players, but still uh, not an indie release necessarily. And uh, this is among the first examples I'm aware of, of a commercial professional game studio adopting some AI tools. And the last story we'll be covering is about an AI film festival, the second annual film festival organized by generative AI startup Runway that, uh, after it ran, showcased the top 10 finalist films, all of which incorporated AI in some form. So, for instance, doing AI-generated backdrops, animations, synthetic voiceovers, and special effects. And the title of the article says that humanity triumphed over tech because there is some editorial evaluation of the finalists' films. And the claim is that the limitations of current AI tools were evident in the films, with some scenes clearly being the product of an AI model. And some films were constrained by limitations of AI with disjointed scenes and a lack of control over generative models. But uh, despite these limitations, uh, some of the films were able to still be good due to strong scripts and performances. So the argument is that human contributions still make a difference. Right? We still don't have AI that can generate films that are compelling. And I would argue that that's probably going to remain true for a while. But uh, we are still kind of pretty early on. And uh, I did look at a couple of the videos. And if nothing else, it's interesting to see people trying to start uh, and to come up with how to utilize limitations with its current uh how do you utilize the technology with its current limitations to produce something compelling? Mm-hmm. All righty. Well, that's it for the news for this episode. Slightly fewer stories than usually you do, just because we wanted to focus on the exciting new announcements. So with the remaining time, uh, since Deliana does host the, uh, Data, the Data, Science Scientist Pod- show. Data Scientist show in which she interviews many people about their paths uh, throughout their careers and uh, kind of learnings. Seems like it would be fun if Daliana did like a short little interview of me so listeners can get a sense for my background and my thinking on AI. So let's see how it goes. Daliana, you can go in and take over. Yeah. So since we were talking about art, when I was looking at your uh, personal website, I noticed you like uh, films, you like music. So I'm curious, if you didn't become an AI researcher, what would be another career you wanted to get into? That's a very interesting question. Yeah, I do feel there's a good chance I would have wanted to pursue something in the creative arts. Mm -hmm. Uh, perhaps with film, I do enjoy uh, video editing in particular, so I could see myself doing that. Uh, and another possible route that I may still pursue at some point is writing fiction, okay. because I do enjoy reading a lot. And I've written some short stories and a lot of essays over the years, so I do like writing, even though it can be very hard. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of possible paths for me that are not technical. Yeah. Uh, Have you published any short stories? Yeah, uh, just a couple, a few. In fact, last year and even before the release of Mm ChatGPT, me and a friend started a little newsletter project called Stories by AI, where we published one short story per week with the idea to experiment with how we could use AI to aid in the creation of short stories and uh, still have our kind of control over the short stories and be the offers, but use the tools to uh, see how they, they could help. And as part of that, I did publish, I think about maybe three or four things I wrote up. And the project, we stopped around mid of last year because it was kind of coming to a point where ChatGPT and these other things 
were so good and so many people were creating AI content, it didn't seem like an interesting thing to explore necessarily anymore. But I did have a lot of fun publishing and writing those few things. Nice. And uh, uh, what kind of experience do you want people to have when they read your stories or in the future watch some videos you created? I think personally what I like a lot is when things are interesting, when things sort of like give you a moment of uh, being taken aback by some new idea or some interesting notion or something you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. So my if I do write something or make more videos for YouTube, which I did for a while and released a couple of things, uh, I think that'd be a heavy... Uh, maybe even intellectual component or or conceptual component to it and less sort of, I don't know, action or... Mm. Uh, Do you have thing. example? Well, the short stories I, I have put out <laughs> are, I guess, examples of that where I think the last one I wrote was conceptually uh, a chronicle of in the near future a few decades from now uh it's kind of a bleak one where it's this write-up of how humanity descended into decades long wars over resources due to a combination of climate change and uh, militaries being uh, continuously more automated with more and more robot soldiers so essentially you got into a dynamic where you have endless war with all the sides just manufacturing robots to mm -hmm. send out in a battlefield to fight over uh, resources that are increasingly necessary as climate change and, and technology racing happens. So that's an example. Uh, and there was a little twist of like the narrator author of that one was actually an AI that wrote propaganda mm. and was aware of all these secret details and so on. Yeah. Uh, so stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sounds like you do think about like AI a lot, even in the, your art creation. So you talk a lot about AI safety. Uh, where, where do you stand? Are you more of a, you know, doomer or... Uh, yeah, we've gotten into this with Jeremy uh, in the past uh, sometimes, and we are very much, it's we have op opposite views <laughs> with my regular co-host, where my regular yeah. co-host is very concerned about uh -huh. AI even potentially exterminating humanity. Mm -hmm. And personally, I'm very skeptical we should be that worried yeah. for numerous reasons we had a whole episode if listeners want to go into that i think uh, like latish last year on ai safety and alignment so personally i think there are a lot of concerns that are legitimate with misinformation with scamming which is already happening uh with people you know getting addicted to uh, romance with AIs yeah. and, and moving away from human attraction. Yeah. A lot of these very significant things, but I'm very skeptical that there is a real uh, pathway, even if we got to human level AI, for that to lead to a significant number of people being, as Zoomer say, exterminated. Mm. Yeah. But you're less worried compared to the people on the ex that extreme side. I, it seems like you're also very excited about the um, development. So, In some ways, I think even as someone who's been in AI for a while, it's come to the point where the pace of AI mm -hmm. progress is a little jarring. Uh, and and it's, there's so many impacts it will have on so many people like voice actors, like illustrators, like copywriters and authors in general. Uh, and it's it's hard not to both be excited by things. And I'm someone who uses ChatGPT a lot, and I really like how it helps me do some of my work and some of my writing. 
but that comes with some costs as with previous uh, technological revolutions. So it's it's a, a sense of excitement at what people will do with these very powerful tools combined with some worry about the people who will be hurt by the tools. Yeah. And you said you have been in AI research for a while. Can you tell us how did you get into AI? What was your journey like? Sure. It's interesting. It goes back a long while. Uh, I guess the starting point, you might argue, was in high school, where we had a robotics club, where we competed in this uh, program called FIRST that has various high schools building robots to compete in these kind of sports-like games. And I was part of a software team and and wore some of the very simple AI, not not at all like neural nets and so on. So that was my starting point. And then at that point, I didn't think of myself as like heading towards working in AI. And the reason I kind of got more into it was later on in college when I took the intro to AI class I really got excited and and curious and impressed by a lot of what I was learning. And that led me to uh, doing a research internship the summer after that, and then actually joining the lab of a professor as an undergrad researcher, and then doing another internship, doing Mm -hmm. research. So I think I sort of naturally gravitated towards it. Then I tried to be a software engineer for a while and let's say wasn't quite as excited by it. So I went back to Stanford for my master's and PhD that um, also wound up working on AI and robotics. So it's it, it was a, a sense of kind of gravitation towards it, you might say. So you got an internship uh, after high school, like in college, in the lab. How did you get your first internship? Right. So they are, I think they're called RSUs. Uh, Many universities offer research summer uh, internship, including Stanford, for instance. Mm -hmm. So you can apply as a student to work in a research lab and be guided by graduate students uh, on a project. Uh, And so one of the big ones uh, that does this is from CMU and their robotics lab. It's something called uh, RIS, and that's been going on for a while. So I saw, I think I saw a flyer for it. I saw Uh like a a piece of paper hanging on some professor's door when I walked by to ask him questions. And just, yeah, it really, I would not have been aware of it as a possibility, I don't think, Mm -hmm. had I just not seen that as I was walking around campus and yeah. that led to a lot of our stuff happening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, love those stories. Uh, and you, you from California, you grew up? I grew up in, in a mix of places. I was actually born in Ukraine, in Crimea. And when I was five, we moved to Israel and then when I was 12, my family moved to the U.S. to Georgia. So my undergrad was at Georgia Tech. And it wasn't until after my undergrad that I moved out to the Bay Area, where you know a lot of the software jobs and exciting tech stuff is happening. So now I've been in the Bay Area for almost nine years. And given that a lot of AI is here, it seems like I might stick around for a while longer. Yeah. And uh, can you tell us a little bit what you're currently working on in your company? Is this the first job you took after you finished your PhD? Right. Yeah. So this is, it. it is the first thing I, I did after my PhD. In fact, I started there a couple months before my final defense uh, <laughs> as I was finishing up. And we are working on a platform where people can create games of AI and publish them for other people to enjoy. So as someone who has done YouTube videos, podcasts, photography, uh, all of these sorts of things, uh, some writing, 
uh, I one of the things I wanted or considered doing after the PhD was to go into some company that is using very, very impressive investments in generative AI to enable creativity uh, for more people to build cool stuff. And I also like video games, and it just so happened that there was this early stage startup with like eight people that uh, was founded by a former lab mate who did my P- uh, his PhD with the same advisor. Mm-hmm. So in some way, like my PhD led to me being connected oh. to the startup and, and led to me having that as an option because they were still tiny, right? I would not have mm. known of their existence had that not led to it. And uh, I wonder if it's a little, like I've been there a year now and we don't have for the listeners of a podcast wondering if they can try it out. Let's just say it's not ready yet. Yeah. <laughs> it it turns out to be a hard problem. Uh, but you know, I think it's it's good to take on hard problems and hopefully in not too long a time frame I'll be able to share something cool with people to uh, let them do stuff they would not be able to do without AI. Yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, so when you were taking the offer, have you considered, uh, say, joining an AI research lab in Google or Microsoft, OpenAI? I did think about it, um, but I think ultimately I decided to you could argue pivot or or move away (laughs) from research towards joining a startup because especially towards the latter years of my time as a PhD student, I enjoyed research. I liked it and I would probably enjoy working at NVIDIA or, or Google, but I did miss like building something over a longer time horizon in research. Typically, you do a project uh, to write a paper and you work on it maybe eight months, maybe a year, and that's kind of it. You move on to the next paper, to the next project, and you keep doing that many times over. And so there's a sense where you don't kind of build something over the long term, or you might with a succession of papers building on the same topic or questions. but who you're impacting is other researchers and other people trying to ask questions. So I felt like uh, I would like to use my skill set and knowledge and, and the recent advancements in AI to build something that impacts more people more directly. Yeah. And... Uh... Um, when you started content creation, building the podcast and the news that while you were at, uh, Stanford, so what made you want to, um, start this newsletter and then the podcast? Yeah, there's a bit of a history behind it where <laughs> the kind of seed for it that led to the podcast was, uh, started working in it late 2017 actually and the motivation at that point was that we were starting to get into a lot of ai hype and at the time a decent portion of the coverage in the media was sensationalist or inaccurate in some ways mm-hmm. this was you know just a year after alphago and at that time it seemed like a lot of coverage overemphasized the kind of impressiveness uh, yeah. or or in some other ways wasn't quite right and didn't point out uh, or explain things quite right. So at that point, I started something called Skynet Today, where we published uh, overviews of recent uh, AI headlines, where we tried to point out things that were inaccurate and and just provide better explanations that were informed by understanding AI. That in turn led to starting the uh, Last Week in AI newsletter, 
because I already needed to be up to date of the news to know what to write about. Uh, and at that time, there wasn't really, there were some long running AI newsletters already, but nothing that quite aggregated as much. So we started that like mid 2018, actually, and that's still running. And then the podcast happened in. Uh, March of 2020, <laughs> just before COVID hit. Yeah. And the motivation for that was that I guess it seemed like a natural fit. Uh, it was at a point where AI was starting to roll out and impact more regular people mm-hmm. and, and not just researchers. And I had by that point done YouTube for kind of a while with maybe 10 videos and felt that I would enjoy doing a podcast and producing it and and so on. So we started oh now over <laughs> 4 years ago, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun, so we kept at it just because it is fun and and very useful actually to just for myself to keep track of the news. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember last time I saw you, I asked you, hey, you work on this newsletter and podcast. I think you're also involved in some other AI related publication. Like, are you tired? And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm so tired, but I don't want to stop doing any of those. <laughs> yeah, and it's worth pointing out that uh, these are like team efforts. To some extent, so on the AI newsletter, there's one of a person who helps out, and uh, on the podcast, there's also co-hosts mm-hmm. that help uh, share their efforts, and uh, yeah, in in my other side project, the Gradient, I have sort of taken a bit less of a role to try and and make mm-hmm. time for other things. So yeah, I think. Uh, it's a challenge sometimes. Yeah. I did like as part of focusing on this, I stopped making YouTube videos. The last one I made was late 2020. And that was fun. And you know, I actually somehow got to like 70,000 views on my last YouTube video. Okay. So good. I could see myself doing more of that. But mm-hmm. you have to pick your battles and you only have so much time and I try to make time for enjoying life as well and not just producing content. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so what are the things you do to enjoy life? A lot of it is uh, appreciating art or entertainment. So lately I've been playing some video games. I've been watching some cool TV shows. For uh, example? Uh Currently, I'm watching through Rome on HBO, and that's mm-hmm. fun to see a depiction of a lot of the history and yeah. major events of that time. And I'm playing this game called Sky, which is a very wholesome, kind of beautiful game with a lot of nice scenery and social mechanics. And then uh, I'm a huge fan of films, uh, mm-hmm. so I watch a lot of the classics and know a lot of directors' names and stuff like that and uh, try to make time to go to art house theaters in San Francisco, for instance, yeah. to see new releases. Uh, so that, that's a lot of it. And yeah. then aside from that, uh, I do like um, going to concerts uh, and doing things with friends you know, mm-hmm. going on yeah. hikes and so on. Yeah. So it seems like you do spend a lot of time thinking about the Rome Empire. <laughs> Lately, yes. Lately, yes. Um, and uh, so what are something you're struggling with right now? Yeah, well, uh, the startup life has its challenges, right? Where... I think uh, early on, you know, at a point where we are right now, where you would say probably pre-product market fit, pre-growth, pre like knowing if it'll work, you got to be able to sort of live with the uncertainty of 
maybe all this work we're doing will lead to failure, as is the case with most startups, yeah. and we just won't be able to solve it. Uh, and that does lead to some stress. And, and you know, in, in a startup environment, there's a lot of uncertainty and even like how you, how you should do things, what things you should do. There's a lot of questions you need to proactively think about and uh, take charge of trying to steer the ship yeah. Uh, when there are very few people. So that's the case. And then, yeah, it's, it's, I'm sad that I can't do more in life, that I can't make YouTube videos, uh, at least currently. Uh, if I really try, I might be able to, but, uh, Maybe I have less energy when I was <laughs> than when I was younger, so my output has to some extent decreased. Where mm -hmm. I, I'm not writing much recently, I'm not making YouTube videos. I I do enjoy doing this podcast a lot, but I do wish I could or I could manage to carve out more time for creative outlets. Uh, yeah, but you know, yeah, you gotta pick your battles. Mm -hmm. Have you missed a week since you started? For podcasting, yeah. yes, we've had some weeks where uh, just didn't make sense. In fact, yeah. we had a hiatus uh, in late 2021, mm. I believe, or 2022 uh, for a few months uh, before the release of ChatGPT, where my, the original co-host of a podcast, Sharon Joe, had to move on uh, and there was no co-host, so we just paused for a while. But then Jeremy came on as as the new co-host. Oh, nice! Yeah, um, yeah, I, I can resonate with that. I recently also slowed down the production of my own podcast because I'm trying to figure out what are the things I want to do. Um, for example, spend more time with the career coaching course I'm building and learning new um, coaching skills and doing personal development for myself. And I also realized I actually want to create more um, YouTube videos. I don't have my own channel. Maybe I'll create one for myself. And it does feel very scary when you have a great momentum and then you all of a sudden stop. You feel like, oh, am I going to disappoint people when I stop a podcast? Am I a quote unquote quitter? But on the other side, it also feels oddly freeing in a way that, oh, I don't have to be on this podcast treadmill anymore. Who make the rules? I have to publish every every week. I mean, for, for my own podcast. So, um, yeah, for your own case, do you feel, oh, maybe you can have other hosts, um, say, take over for certain weeks and... Uh, um, or do like bi-weekly. I mean, right now there's so many AI news weekly. There are even daily AI podcasts. Have you thought of ways to scale the podcast and give yourself more freedom? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I'm still currently the editor of a podcast as well. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. I spend a couple hours each week post-recording uh, doing that. So that's one thing I've thought about. I think maybe one of my flaws or arguably things that I could do better at is now that we have some listenership, uh, there's probably a potential for more monetization and sponsors and, and taking this as slightly more professional direction. And I really resist that in some way. Like yeah. I like the idea of just doing this for fun and mm -hmm. for the pure motive of uh helping people keep up with AI, yeah. but uh, we'll see. Maybe I do still enjoy editing it as well and having the full kind of creative control over it, but perhaps in the future, I'll find a way to do this a bit more faster and, and potentially do more, like start, go back to doing interviews in addition to covering news or do YouTube videos or whatever. Yeah. Um, as I'm preparing this episode with you, I can see how much effort you you put in. Um, do you remember a particular Apple comment or, I don't know, do people email you, message you on LinkedIn or something that you feel, ah, oh, it's so worth it. Do you remember something like that? What did it say? 
Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, you help me get through pandemic with all the AI news. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that, but uh, there's. It's hard to pick one out because,、uh, yeah. in general, we get a, so much like. Uh, we covered a few of them in the beginning of the episode, and we do get. I, I you know, maybe I'm self-critical sometimes、mm-hmm. when I release something. I'm not sure that this is really that good, or it's.、Uh, you know, we go through like 35 articles in rapid succession,、yeah. and、uh, there's really not many podcasts out there that do this kind of thing. Like、right. usually, you cover maybe a few stories. Right, we are pretty different, and、yeah. uh, sometimes you're not sure. But maybe we should do things like totally differently. It would be better. But it's nice to see at least a decent number of people like that we cover a lot, and and they say things like, "This is great. This is your top source for AI news. This、mm-hmm. is helping me keep up with AI as a journalist or as a PhD student. Things like that." So. Yeah, that's that's been very nice to see, and、uh, you know, in the first couple of years, we were tiny and didn't have much of a listenership, and we just did it for fun. So it's over the past year, pretty much、uh, a year and a half, that started happening, and been nice to see. Yeah,、um, I really,、uh, you know, respect that you want to keep this. Simple and pure, not to have、um, sponsorships.、Um, I don't know. Maybe someone in the audience, a video editor or something, they want to volunteer or help out, or、um, or I don't know. If you open, I'm sure people want to do something like buy you a coffee or donation. You can buy better equipment. You can you know put it back to the podcast or have a haircut or something. Yeah, and I will <laughs> say、uh, we. I suspect we've had a good number of paid subscribers on our Substack. Oh, nice!、Uh, because of the podcast,、mm-hmm. partially, and so if you do really want to support and are you know a big fan, then one way would be to go over to the last week in that AI site, and we do have paid、uh, subscriptions enabled on the Substack, and、uh, we don't. Do like that's more pretty much for pure support.、Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a, an archive of, ed- of editorials you can get access to if you do that. But aside from that, there's not many perks. We release everything to everyone. Yeah, yeah. And if you like,、uh, leave a comment, subscribe, subscribe on YouTube, five star review. I think those things definitely helps. And speaking of haircut, and before we wrap up, is your hair naturally blonde or no, what do you no. do with your hair? No, it's partially bleached. Oh, okay. You can see, yeah, it's、I、our mean, signature. <laughs> I don't know about that, but、uh, yeah, I have dyed my hair a few times over、mm-hmm. the years, and you're going、uh, for some crazy color. Not, it's kind of boring. I I did dark blue last time, okay,、uh, like a, a grayish thing. Yeah,、mm-hmm. so I、um, I don't think I'll ever go for pink or purple or something. Yeah, but who knows?、Uh, I think it's fun. Yeah, I do try to do a little bit self expression. A fun fact about me. You can do a gradient.、Me. Oh, sorry, <laughs> gradient. <laughs> no pun intended. That's fun. I think that's probably pretty hard to pull off. Yeah,、uh, in terms of the process, but. Aside from bleaching my hair, a fun fact about me is I have how many seven tattoos. Oh wow! So I'm not quite as nerdy as I might seem, or maybe I、okay. am. But do you have do. anything you can show us? Is it like a in the,、uh, any parts available?、Like、oh, what's that? It's like a tree with a, a cube with a tree,、cube. and then、uh-huh. I have this. Wow, what is this? Also a tree, but like a like a neuron tree. Uh huh. Wait, is it、circles. like the kind of the brain shape from Westworld? This, or I just found a photo of a neuron and yeah, did that. So oh wow, I don't know if that make you more nerdy or less nerdy. <laughs> nerdy is maybe cool. Maybe both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So、um, yeah, what is something you are excited in your life or career in the next couple months? I'm excited. I think. 
hopefully to really figure out how to in the startup uh, we're working on we've had some very productive discussions on you know the stuff we've built so far uh, maybe in some ways we underestimated the difficulty of what we were taking on and so I'm excited to hopefully have a lot more insight and, and manage to build the right thing so to speak Mm-hmm. And then aside from that, um, I have f- been thinking about maybe getting back to writing more, uh, doing some essays and maybe even some short fiction uh, just to spread out sort of my focus. So yeah. we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll try to see if I can do that. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. Um, anything else you want to tell your audience or you want them to know? Uh, not not really. I think uh, I will say, yeah, it's uh, always humbling to think that so many people listen. Yeah, and that a lot of people seem to appreciate this thing a lot. That to me is uh, just a, f- a fun thing to do or, or a thing I, I enjoy doing. So I, I do want to thank people who do reach out or leave reviews and so on because uh, it feels nice that to have done something that a lot of people are, at least in some small way, touched by. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, this is fun. Maybe sometime I invite you to my podcast or you, you can interview me or talk more about your, your journey someday. Maybe, yeah, that was fun. Uh, but we are getting a bit far into this recording, so I think we'll go ahead and end it there. And this would be the end of this episode of Last Week in AI. So thank you, Daliana, for co-hosting and for doing this fun interview segment that hopefully our listeners will enjoy. (laughs) Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And as we mentioned uh, in the conversation, and as I always say at the end, we would like you to share the podcast, to leave a review, to do those nice things. But more than anything, we do like knowing that people listen and benefit from us doing this so please do keep tuning in